All right, hello everyone, and thank you for joining us today. My name is Radel Peisler, and on behalf of Cornerstone, I want to welcome you to today's webcast, Employee Development, Compliance, and Beyond. So in today's program, our panel of experts will explore how creating a learning culture at your organization can help you meet compliance, drive employee engagement and retention, and ultimately influence mission success. Uh, before we get started here, I'd like to go over a few housekeeping items. At the bottom of the platform you see, you'll see several icons. One is the Q&A tab, which allows you to ask us some questions, so please do that at any time. We will have time for audience Q&A at the end of the session, but you can submit your questions at any point. Today's presentation can be downloaded if you go to your Attachments and Link tab. And then finally, if you experience any technical difficulties, please click on the Help icon for support. All right, so at this time, I would like to introduce our speakers for today. First, we have Jonathan Gartner. Jonathan is the Director of Talent and Organizational Development with the Department of Health and Human Services. In this capacity, he serves as the HHS Chief Learning Officer. Jonathan is a thought leader in learning, organization development, and engagement. He collaborates across organizational boundaries to create efficient workforce development programs and culture enrichment activities. And then I also have with me Steve Dabrowski. He's the Senior Principal of the Thought Leadership and Advisory Services at Cornerstone. Steve is a former federal government executive with over 12 years of competitive service. He has spent seven years in HR and HR IT leadership roles, ensuring effective talent management process at the bureau level at the department level, and at a shared service center where he delivered solutions for multiple agencies. He has guided numerous agencies and organizations through successful implementations and utilization of unified talent management suites. So we have a wealth of experts and information to share with you today here. So thank you both for joining me. I'm going to turn the floor over to Steve to kick off today's discussion. Thank you, Raydell. Uh, hello, everyone. It is a pleasure to be on this uh, webinar with you today. Uh, we're going to be talking about something that we all have to deal with as training professionals. That's compliance training and then mandatory training. Um, but we're going to take a different spin, and we're going to talk about how to create a learning culture which will have an impact on the delivery, the substance of the compliance training. I want to welcome Jonathan to the discussion. Jonathan um, has a number of years of experience, as you heard at HHS, but also he's got a rich experience with the VA and, and years past. Um, a little bit of, uh, about in depth of, of my, my experience in the federal sector is I was with the Treasury Department in a shared service capacity. I also was in charge of leadership and development at the IRS. And fun fact, I worked for the IRS and my birthday is April 15th, so it was like the perfect, you know, destiny, but it didn't work out, and here I am at Cornerstone. I want to talk to you about uh, the learning culture in organizations, and we're going to kind of very informally go between Jonathan and I, so we're going to keep this lively and discussion-based um, on this, and I do encourage you to submit any questions you might have to us, uh, and we'll take those in the end. Uh, so Jonathan, um, I want to start by setting the stage with what's going on in the world out there. One of the things that we know as an organization, as a company, as an agency, we know that um, organizations need to have this competitive edge uh, in order to attract and retain its individual employees. We have to have that driving um, uh, momentum to, to stay in, in our organization. We need to make it an uh, attractive and sustainable way to do that. But what we also know is that really our only resource, despite the budgets going down, uh, the different competitive advantages, those types of things that we have, the high-tech stuff that's going on in the world today, what we know is we're being forced to do more and more with our less. And what we also know is that government organizations are no different than uh, the private sector, right? So we know that federal governments and public sectors as a whole um, are, are, are really being asked to do more with less 
but also we have to we have to recognize that people are our resources and we have to clear boundaries or clear obstacles to making sure that it's a learning environment, uh, a caring culture in our organizations, and making sure that we're doing with the, the most that we can with the resources that we actually have. And as you can see from this graphic, this idea of the amount of discretionary spending that organizations have, budget, budgets that they have in terms of spending stuff on uh, stuff that's not mandatory is going down and it's continuing down. So that idea of uh, things are going to change or it's going to get better, we're going to have more money to, to spend on our, our folks and our uh, causes is, is kind of non-existent. The budgets are being cut and from those budgets they're being eaten up that mandatory training is now becoming, or mandatory spending is becoming something that we actually have to really focus in on. So it's really becoming more and more grim as we start going into um, budget-wise. So let's talk a little bit about how we do different things in organizations and what we see with the trends that are going on in the organizations in HR. Jonathan? Steve, you were stealing my thunder. I was thinking, oh, Steve is talking. He's basically hit on what I really wanted to discuss in the slide. HR works under really constrained resources daily. We work under, we're pressured. We're pressured, like Steve said, to do more with less. But as the budgets are decreasing, the pressure to do or be more efficient in the way that we're providing our services and attracting, you know, talent is increasing. Um, the cost to do business is also increasing. We all know that in the private sector they lead innovation, they lead, you know, with technology. They have very clear, defined processes, and in the government or in the government, we, we don't. We fall kind of behind in that area. Um, while when you look at how we're managing talent, we're, we're really at the point where we're trying to build human capital strategy or HR strategy um, and really leverage better use of systems to have data and be able to make data-driven decisions. But this idea of doing more with less, like Steve said, it's not going away. Um, it's going to become even more uh, necessary as we enter into the future. Steve, can you advance to the next slide? The changing role of actually, so one thing about the private and the public sector that people say is different is one is for profit, one is not for profit. One is very, about, very much about pleasing the customer. But when you look at HR, our customers are our employees. And so there's really no difference from employee retention and customer retention. So let's, let's look at this slide for a moment. 71% of customers, you know, when they encounter service multiple times, they come back for the same service. 73% percent of customers after having contact um, with customer service multiple times for the same reason. HR is the same way. What our customers expect, our customers are our employees. They want to speak to someone. They want fast service. They want an organization to support them that is supportive. And they want the process to be easy. HR has changed over the years, the role of HR. First, when you think about it, look at the terminology. We went from using words like personnel to human resources in an attempt to remove the stigma associated with slow and bureaucratic process. HR kind of shifted from transactional processing centers to strategic partners that are sitting at the table. We are now sitting at the table with the business leaders like the CFO and the Chief Information Technology Officer and the, you know, Chief Administrative Officer to actually make decisions and contribute in a way that really positions the employee as the organization's greatest asset. Think about the HR generalist for a moment. That role as HR has shifted, that role has shifted. 
the HR generalist now is expected to serve as that technology proponent, that change champion, and that connector in the organization. That HR generalist, generalist now uses data to inform managers on how they might be able to, to strategically fill jobs or address some sort of workforce planning challenge. We are business partners that apply the same scientific rigor and business value to internal team members as most organizations do with their customers. And I, I think, Jonathan, to, to your point, I think the added responsibility of the HR generalist is becoming more and more of this diagnosis that we actually have to go through, taking data that we actually have to do or that we have, analyze it, and making up some um, path forward. The other thing that I think that we're becoming now is we have to market some of the stuff that we actually do. Uh, think of your last training programs and the campaigns that you've had with your various training programs. You've almost had to convince people that you need to go out and take this training for whatever reason. What's in it for me is not necessarily lost on the individual employees when we talk about training, right? So that role is constantly changing. Now, what's interesting is when we start talking about what organizations want in, in their work, what individuals want in their work, this is interesting that it came from um, Deloitte University. Uh, and in it, there was, there was five things that they actually said that the, that the folks wanted. Uh, they wanted meaningful work. They wanted the freedom to do what they wanted to do in, in terms of autonomy. Uh, they want to be, uh, have work on smart, empowered teams. They want to, you know, have some downtime, but also some really working hard towards it, but it, we believe in the work. We want to have hands-on management. We want to have this coaching component to our management component. Our, our, our interactions. We want to have a positive working environment. We want it to be flexible. We also want to be recognized in work. Uh, probably maybe the most important one, although we do believe we want trust in our, our leadership for us and for this conversation, what I think is really the important thing here is that folks are looking for a growth opportunity, that they're looking for training and development opportunities um, across organizations. We know now that um, regardless if we're talking public sector or private sector, we know that individuals today are expected to have 11 different jobs in the career, right? Um, so organizations that welcome this and embrace it and develop this career path are going to be a lot likelier to um, be successful in, in, in attracting and retaining those folks that we, we actually want to attract and retain. So let's take a look at, you know, all these different things that are going on, the different pressures, different changes of, uh, of uh, HR and the different pressures, shrinking budgets, those types of things. Let's take a look at this. I, I don't know that I'm going to get an answer from you, but um, I, I want to talk. I live in Washington, D.C., and I am uh, a bit of a technology seeker. I love technology. And I saw this walking down, uh, down the sidewalk near my neighborhood in, in Columbia Heights in Washington, D.C., um, and it fascinated me. I didn't know what it was, so I, I snuck up on it and I got like a closer picture. Uh, I, I just, just take a second and try to guess what this is. I don't know if you're going to be able to guess it, but I'll put you out of your misery in two seconds. But I, I followed this thing around for a good 10, 15 minutes to see what the heck it was. And as it turns out, it's an Amazon robot delivering the packages uh, in the neighborhood. It was pretty awesome. It was this idea of changing a fundamental thing that I was used to seeing, that being the UPS guy or, you know, the FedEx guy delivering Amazon packages, but a robot and automatic delivery. To, it was pretty fascinating. Essentially, this has absolutely nothing to do with the presentation, but I think it speaks volumes to what's going on in the workforce, right? So um, while this Amazon robot may have nothing to do with this presentation or the work that you do, what it does signify is that technology is actually having an impact on how we do work. Um, it's expecting, it's changing the way we consume information. It's changing the way that we interact with individuals, right? So we have, you know, everything from ordering your car on your phone to reserving your place at an Airbnb or connecting on LinkedIn. You know, we have all these expectations of how we interact in a private sector, 
and in our private lives. It does not stand to reason that this is going to have an impact on our professional life and on our public work that we do. So what this is ultimately doing is it's changing the way we uh, interact and identify and select our, our systems and, and the, what we choose to pay attention to. You know, we, we choose the way we, we have uh, our experiences. So no longer do we go to the products or the technology. We, we select how those user experiences are, are dealt with. How do I interact with the Netflix or the Amazon interaction? It really affects the way we're doing it. You know, think about it for a moment. I'm sure everyone has a smartphone on them nowadays, but you know, you customize your, your smartphone by selecting the apps that you want and where you place them. It's all about that user experience and making it intuitive and taking the process out of the equation and making it really simplified user experience. And when we start talking about learning and leadership and, and compliance and every kind of training that you can think of, that really has to be at our fundamental basis. And so, Jonathan, I guess I want to toss it back to you to talk a little bit about what's going on with status quo. Steve, ultimately, we just can't keep doing the same thing that we're doing. When you look at these statistics from a recent Deloitte study, it suggests that, you know, learning and development professionals, 66% of them said that they have trouble getting employees to engage in their offerings. Um, why is that? Is it that we are continuing to do the same thing and expecting a different result? 37% of organizations believe that their learning development programs are effective. Is it, could that potentially be because we're not targeting the right training for the right people when it's necessary? And less than 50% of workers report having completed a course within 12 months. Many organizations invest a lot of money into their L&D programs. And these statistics are alarming. I think it, it makes you think about what is it that we can do differently to really, one, improve, maybe improve the training that we're developing, maybe target it or package it. Because a lot of us have great training, but if people don't know that the training is exist or if or if it, 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 it's not packaged to the right people in the right way, no one's ever going to bite on it. And so I think this idea that, that we can just keep doing the same thing and people will come. You can build a beautiful house, and if nobody knows that it's sitting there because it's a 1,000 miles from the nearest highway, no one's ever going to come. It's almost, if I could throw another technology thing in there, it's we, we continue to buy the biggest, best systems like 3D TVs, but we continue to offer black and white TV shows, right? So Very we, can't, can, we can't expect to have different results uh, if we're doing the same thing over and over again. I agree. We can't expect to have different results doing the same thing. So let's, let's look at the learning challenge. Again, consumerization effect. Does your user experience deliver on the employee's expectations? Steve mentioned it earlier. He said that technology is driving the expectations of our customers, and our customers are our employees. They are who receive our products or our training. How do we really accelerate the way that we're developing professional skills through our training. Are we really concerned about who's supposed to receive what? And, and if, a, if training is going to the, the most diverse audience, like compliance training, are we communicating in a way that everyone will understand? Ultimately, training really has the opportunity to drive engagement of our employees. HHS, so I went from working at the VA at an agency that was at like number 18 on the best places to work ranking for large agencies to working for an agency that's at number five. HHS has continued to really excel in employees' perceptions about one, not only the way that they're offering development, 
But global satisfaction overall with regard to the way they, one, contribute to the mission and the agency cares for them. I'm going to turn it over to Steve so that Steve can delve a little bit into the learning mindset and how yeah, we I, begin I also, to... Sorry, Jonathan. I, I, I want to sorry, focus Steve. in... Uh, on the experience that I had, I want to reinforce that, that the whole idea of driving engagement and doing things differently while I was at the IRS, right? So no different than a lot of what you guys are facing currently, Jonathan and HHS, and also I, I know you had this experience at VA, is you don't have any money to do anything differently. You don't have the expenses or the, the budget to support doing anything completely creative. But, what the IRS did was it looked for ways to be creative. It, we offered this just-in-time training where we relied on our people to deliver the training as opposed to vendors. And this is odd, me being a vendor and saying this now, but you, know, you don't always have to look outside your organization to create that learning challenge. What I really want to dive into is what's going on with our learning and our mindset of, of learning and, and how that's affecting um, the way we deliver our content and the way it's being consumed. If we looked at the way we did it before, and we'll call this the legacy, the way we did training, um, it was very business-centric. Uh, it was very transactional. It was very LMS-driven, and we're reporting on how many people completed this training. It all was about compliance. It was all about conformity. We had this top-down notion that we were actually delivering from HR or the learning organization down to the individual organizations. Now, if we step back and take a look at um, where we are today in terms of that concept of training, we're actually focusing in on the learner-centric. Our learning is now becoming and should be becoming experiential. It should be this curated content. We're allowing the individuals to select and identify what training they want, not something that they're being pushed. We want them to be able to pull, and I'm certain you've heard this push versus pull battle. This is constantly going on. We want individuality. We want freedom in our training. We're moving away from this time box concept where we have classes and courses and completions and grades to this, this more ongoing, informal type of training where we have this personalization, this social, the collaborative, right? So we're creating opportunities for people that aren't necessarily coworkers in the same team to work together, to collaborate, because we recognize that the value of collaboration makes us greater in the work that we're able to accomplish. Also, uh, the other thing that we'll talk a little bit about later is the effect that mobile and uh, social networking is happening on, on that. But let's start by diving into some of the compliance stuff. So let's talk about why people learn. If we accept that the purpose of learning is to affect impact behaviors, we want that information to achieve a purpose. So what's the purpose of learning at work for your employees? Well, we need to start by asking your, yourself questions about how and what do people want to learn in your organization, and when, uh, when do they want or when do they need that information uh, to, to solve that problem, and, and how do you impact that behavior from there? So Jonathan, so what, what do, do you, we get at work? So what you get at work is you get don't harass your employees. Or you get, you know, please sign the policy. Did you take the code of conduct? We get, oh, records management training is due. Oh, don't forget your privacy security awareness training. Consider for a moment, you know, when you're at work and you attempt to learn something or you need a resource, do you have what you need? Do you have access to a place where those things are cataloged for you in a way that makes sense? Um, or is everything just compliance training? Consider the courses that, you know, you were assigned. You know, did you attend or did you skip something that could have been helpful? How did you decide what you might have wanted to participate in if for, a, if, for instance, your agency did have a plethora of offerings available to you, was there something that said, I'm a 201 HR specialist and these are the courses that I might want to take 
at this stage in my career. Um, I know when I was at the VA, and I was the director of the VA Human Resources Academy, we, we took on this challenge for our HR professionals. We actually created curriculum and career maps that would really show the HR professional, if they were arriving at our agency as a GS5, what they might want to take to get to a GS7 if they were a classifier, or what they might need to know if they were a recruitment and staffing specialist focusing exclusively on merit promotion but wanted to get that delegated examining unit, unit certification. We created curriculum and career maps all linked to our LMS that would show an employee where they are today and what training and resources might be able to get them to where they want to be in the future. I remember you actually talking about that, Jonathan, that when you guys built that, it was the My Career VA. Uh, I thought it was really brilliant. It showed you transparency, where you guys wanted to go, what you could possibly do, and it puts the control of the learning in the end user, that is the employee's control. I thought that that was a brilliant move by you guys. Absolutely. Thank you. So I think compliance training often gets a bad rap. It's that training that nobody wants to take. It's the training that's click, you know, you just click through the slides and you get to the end and you guess on the test. But really what compliance training offers a learning and development organization is the opportunity to get your entire audience or your entire population of people you serve, you take them hostage. They all have to take this course. So why not attach or recommend some other courses at the end of that course that market or promote some other things that you're doing. So if, you're, if you have an online module for your, that supports your supervisory 101 requirement or your supervisory training requirement, why not at the end of those online modules suggest some other modules that might develop interpersonal communication skills or that might you know, develop conflict resolution skills? Compliance training really offers us an opportunity to reach our entire audience. And if we try something new, if we think about, you know, what we could present in that moment that makes sense, if we could package it in a way that is meaningful, we might see some, some different results in our usership numbers. So let's look at how we can, you know, structure success in this area. We want to diversify our learning modalities. Not everybody learns the same way, but more importantly, not every subject should be taught or instructed in the same way. Um, we also want to diversify the learning engagement. There are, there are many opportunities when you're thinking about, you know, ways that we can communicate or present information, um, dialogue, instructor-led, you know, people love instructor-led training, but, you know, a lot of people learn really by doing. So creating some sort of, you know, opportunity to create gamification, and, and that, that doesn't necessarily have to involve a lot of technology. It's just the way that we can build these opportunities into our our content. Um, we want the training that we're developing to really speak to the person that it's intended for. A lot of these mandatory training requirements come from OPM, and there's one in particular that was around fair employment opportunities. It came out while I was at the VA, and our recruitment, the personal recruitment and staffing policy came to me and said, I want all managers and supervisors to be required to take this test or this course in addition to all of our HR specialists. So mandatory training is something that the VA took very seriously. It's, it costs a lot of money to send or to have your employees go through mandatory training. So I, I spoke to her about the requirement, and I read the regulation from OPM because it came down as, as something OPM wanted supervisors to have. But when you read the language, and you thought about the process, 
suitability doesn't really lie with the It lies with the people adjudicating suitability. So that you went from offering that course to 20,000 managers at the VA to a smaller subset of about 4,000 adjudicators and 7,000 HR professionals. So you saved money there by looking at who, who should actually take this training and, you know, who might, want, who might we want to suggest take the training. Um, so I think looking at your target audience, looking at the context, of what's being offered is necessary. And also I would add that it's, it's something that you're never done with, right? So it's that constant evaluation. It's this idea of it is. once you think you're, you're done, you still have to make continuous improvements. So it's not something you're, you're done with if, if you're truly effective. Yeah, you're never, you're right, Steve, you're never done. You always want to, you know, most people use the Addy model. There's always at the end that you know, you need to go back and look at how well you're doing, how was it received. You know, you, one, need to refresh the training to make sure the regulations are still accurate. Absolutely correct. So let's look for a moment at building that foundation. As you build a foundation for your program, you know, it's really important to remember the diversity of the audience that will be using it. Remember that People like to learn different topics and subjects in different ways. Sometimes we have time to sit and learn, you know, particularly when it's new. Other times we just need it fast and quick. You know, we need a strong program that offers all those options and opportunities to collaborate. I think one of the best things that I've seen done in the, in the last few years is this just-in-time training. You know, if you're creating a pivot table, um, and you can't remember how to do something, being able to load up that three-minute video that shows you how to create a pivot table in Excel is amazing um, because you just need that refresher. I think creating the full course, the more we can modularize the training, the better and more useful it will be for the end user. We really need to make learning and development easy for our employees so that they find what they need in the learning options that we provide. And, and when they need it, right? So and make when. it easy to find and when they need it, right? So if we could just boil that down into three things that we think all modern learning, this applies to not only the compliance training that you have to take, the mandatory training that you have to take, but all learning as you're developing it. We need to make sure that we're focusing in on targeting um, personalized learning experiences, giving them the freedom and capacity to select what training they take. A lot of folks, like Jonathan mentioned, and IRS and Treasury had done as well, is deliver this through the LMS and put the control back into the end user, the employee's hands. But we also need to take it a step further, and we need to provide these opportunities to be collaborative and this social component. And uh, Jonathan, I, maybe this is a point that we pause and talk a little bit about, are there any initiatives that you guys have that either at the VA that you were working on or at HHS that would wrap around this idea of social or how are you dealing with the mobile and the efficiency component of modern learning at HHS or VA? So right now I know at HHS we aren't at the point right now where we're, we're doing mobile yet. Um, that, is a, that is somewhere that we want to go. However, we, we are building social components into our leadership development programs and into our more co cohort-based programs. But right now, we haven't really delved into the area of mobile. I know when I was working at VA, they were implementing a learning management system um, as I was leaving, that was going to bring to the VA the mobile component. And um, I'm not sure the progress of that, but that is also an area that HHS really is looking to enter into in the next few years. Um, we really, right now, we've actually kicked off a distributed learning assessment so that we can identify across the HHS enterprise, you know, what learning tools are we using right now? Um, 
at NIH, at CDC, at SAMHSA, at HRSA, how are they being used? Um, so right now we have a partner working with us on this assessment so that we can build an HHS enterprise learning strategy. What would you say, Jonathan, is the biggest challenge? It sounds like HHS is not doing mobile. What would you say is the biggest challenge for HHS in terms of wrapping around mobile capacity? Is it security? Is it security? Is it funding? It's security, it's funding, and it's infrastructure. Right now, HHS is actually, so our LMS and our human resource information system and the budget system, those systems span the entire enterprise. But when you look at our desktop applications, they are unique to each operating division. So it's a mix of budget and technology. Each operating division has their own firewall regulation. It's, it's, it's interesting. <laughs> yeah. So I, I, I'm, I'm, asking, I'm asking you these questions because I totally understand where you're coming from. It's not just HHS. It's, it's everywhere. It's across the board. When we talk about revolutionizing the learning and, and everyone in the public sector just raises their eyebrows or rolls their eyes that, it's, oh, yeah, that'll never happen in my agency. It's really out there. It's really happening. And that thought of the security and it's really expensive and we can't afford it, those are being like cleared up that it's really not that complex and it's really not that uh, a big of a security risk. There are things that have been done that make this a safe environment. I guess I want to go back to, all right, so if, if we accept the fact that an LMS is, just isn't enough anymore, so how then do we, how do, how do we position this? So we know that technology is having this impact on us and our personal life. Should it be any different when we go into our learning management system or when we take our learning training that we actually have to comply with? If we want to be successful, if we want to have people use our training and we want people to consume it, we need to present it in a manner that needs to be presented. And the learner experience, going back to something that we talked about before, how we position learning for our end users is going to become critical. And in today's society with today's technologies and today's generations that are in the workforce and consuming the information, we have to come to where they are and consume, give them the, the material to consume in the manner that they choose, right? So this notion of putting learning up based on, you know, individuality, based on, Jonathan, I heard you mention about, like, your, what position you're, you're in or what your career goals are, but also stuff like if you're familiar with Netflix or Amazon, you know, personalizing some of the stuff that you're offered up based on what you've done in the past. We're at a point now where technology's uh, keeping up with us at a regular basis and sometimes ahead of us in a lot of instances. And there's technology out there that knows that what, based on this type of training that I took in the past, I'm more likely to take these types of trainings. Or these individuals that have taken this training and are very successful in an organization uh, should be taking these as well, right? So you look to that for recommendations, and the learner experience really needs to become front and center. For those of you that are familiar with this, I wanted to include this slide because it really is becoming um, the new way that we do learning. We, we actually have to position it. It looks like TV. Uh, I saw a stat the other day from um, uh, a survey from, I think it was Deloitte or Harvard Business Review, actually, and it talked about how um, today's generation, when, when we ask them about what, what is TV, they don't think of the, the ABC, CBS, that kind of stuff. They say Netflix, right? So it's that notion that it's on demand and I'm in my control at my fingertips. And so this is now bleeding into the workforce, and it's also bleeding into the public sector workforce because this expectation does not change just because we work for the government. So this idea of personalizing it becomes all the more important. Wouldn't you say, Jonathan? I would. I think, you know, e-learning is changing and it continues to evolve. Think about, you know, when I bought my first phone, my first smart, well, my first cell phone in 1990, 1990, 
six or seven, it was like a cordless house phone. And, and we don't even use those anymore. But think about how cell phones went turned to smartphones and then how smartphones have gotten smaller. They've become more easy to use. They now allow us to manage our bank accounts. They allow us to watch YouTube videos to learn how to tie a bow tie or change a carburetor or replace your air filter. All of, all of that is learning. So the more we can do to make learning accessible to the employee and learn in different styles is going to make our jobs a lot easier. Micro-learning, um, which is learning under 12 minutes or even eight minutes long, you know, there are assessments that you can use that will result in a specific series of lessons that are tailored to particular skills. Um, I think that you can find even animated shorts that are based on published and popular ideas, trends, or theories. Learning is changing allowing you to create a varied and customized experience for your employees, which is more engaging than, you know, that compliance training we've been subject to for years. Interesting, um, statistic, interesting statistic, Jonathan. In 2007, any ideas as to what the most popular phone was? 2007. I'm going to say it was probably, it probably was the, it wasn't Samsung. It had to be. It had to be the iPhone. No. No, the iPhone was just coming out. They're just celebrating a decade long now. But the most popular phone That's was true. the razor. Was the the razor? Remember that the razor? Phone? Yeah. Oh my God! I had that. <laughs> that was only <laughs> ten years ago. I actually waited in line for the first iPhone. So that was only yeah. ten years ago. I don't know why it seems longer. Yeah. But um. So let's look for a moment at how we can personalize our training and what – well, put context around our training that will equal personalization. Providing employees with context around learning and why they should learn and, you know, why learning is important, it really enables them to focus their learning on topics that will drive their career, drive performance in their jobs, and really drive engagement in our company or our department. We need to empower our employees to take control of their own professional development. That's one, that's one of the major things. So we've, we've created a, a series of workshops that, will, that support employee engagement within my group. And, and, I mean, this guy who created this, his name is Jim, his name is Jim Egbert. He's a genius. <laughs> I tell him all the time. But he, he had this idea that, you know, on the employee viewpoint survey, there's a question about my supervisor assesses my skills or my supervisor, my learning needs are assessed. You know, the workshop actually gets employees to realize we own our employee experience. We can assess our own learning needs and then take that assessment to our supervisor and say, I've assessed my learning needs. These are the areas I think I can improve. What do you think? And so the idea that we empower our employees to take hold of their own experience is really, really powerful. It provides for continuous feedback. You know, it allows them to grow professionally in areas where they not only need to grow, but where they want to grow. And it's a really strong performance tool um, that managers can use to really, you know, drive employee performance. And I know, you know, one of the things that came out, I think it was back in April, was OMB M1722, which requires all um, managers and supervisors receive training on how to maximize the performance of, the, of, of employees. So looking at, you know, how we can put context around learning and why it's important and show employees how, you know, through these opportunities or these things that we're offering them for, as an L&D shop can improve their employee experience. 
So to further um, expand about this notion of context, Jonathan, we really, I heard you mention this idea back at the VA how you had a career path and you allowed folks to develop themselves accordingly. This idea of creating the path for individuals to consume by on their own is really, really powerful, right? So nowadays you can go into your LMS, uh, you can do your mandatory training, your compliance training, but I can also work on my development uh, as an individual and take training. More often than not, agencies are offering you free resources to develop yourself in any way that you choose uh, and identify some of the gaps that you might have on, on developing yourself. Let's say you, want, you have aspirations to be in career X, but you're in career Y. Uh, how do you then course correct and get over to X? What sort of skill gaps do you actually need? Um, and and how, how am I allowing my individual employees the visibility into their own careers to do that? Uh, really driving motivation and attracting folks to stay in an organization. More times than not, if an employee feels the love from an organization, they will like, be more likely to stay in that organization because they feel that their needs uh, and wants are being addressed by the organization and that they care for it. You mentioned the employee viewpoint survey, also a very important indicator of how individual employees view their learning and their development, right? So we should always be mindful of what our end users or our customers, as you mentioned earlier, our employees, Jonathan, what they think about it and get that feedback from the actual learning. But I want to just maybe drive one other point home is that, you know, we, we, we talked a lot about what we can do as learning organizations. You know, a part of what we can do is get out of the way, right? So we can create environments for learning and get out of the way. And that's another not fancy term for collaborative learning and social learning, right? So creating opportunities for teams to work together that may not have day-to-day uh, -day interactions, but we create that matrix organizations where you allow them to um, collaborate to accomplish something, to achieve something that may not be in their day-to-day -day operations. So Jonathan, do you guys have any sort of uh, social networking or social learning or collaborative effort going on at HHS, or did you have anything at um, VA? So within the operating division, they do have some social learning um, components that they're using, but they're, they're, they're happening within that operating division and not necessarily across. But I know at the VA, they did have a couple of um, social collaborative um, learning opportunities. One was something that they call VA Pulse. And VA Pulse was, um, it began as an idea factory. And then they added a piece onto it that allowed you to have uh, forums on specific topics. And then, because that was successful, they began to use that to launch initiatives. So for the VA Employee Engagement Initiative, they created a sort of forum where they posted all of the things and tools related to employee engagement that would be helpful for managers. They had things that... Um, tools that employees could use to, you know, take hold of um, or understand what engagement was and how they could be more engaged at work. So VA did, did have something at the enterprise level that supported, you know, that social and collaborative space. Um, at HHS, we're looking to do something at the enterprise, but it is happening within the operating division. So if, if there's something that I, I would say you should walk away from, from this webinar, it's like recognize the impact that technology and the way people are learning has an impact on the way we do our work. And our work, if we accept it, is to deliver effective content and deliver learning to our individual users and our employees, um, creating transparency in how we do this. One thing I would say to folks is that idea of thinking that you're done um, and that you've done the greatest course on earth and you've delivered it and hey everyone had positive results that's just the start of you doing it all over again right so continuous improvement we have to be more um, mindful of what's next we have things like artificial intelligence that's coming into our actual systems now this idea of big data is you know we have to get ahead of these trends and either embrace them or secure them so they're actually going to have an impact 
uh, the desired impact on our workforce, making sure that we can control for that and anticipate what's coming next. Because in today's society, in today's technology, we cannot be behind the curve on this or we're going to be left behind. And so it's really important when we start talking about what's next, um, we really need to focus in on those types of questions as to what's coming in terms of technology. And then I guess, Jonathan, maybe you could just close us out with some of the, the closing thoughts that you might have. And then I think we're going to be taking some questions real quick. I think we need to, as learning and development professionals, really personalize the experience for employees. We need to, by, by personalizing it, add context around, you know, the why. Why should they develop themselves? Why should they seek professional development opportunities? I think that the more meaningful we can make training and the more assess accessible we can make training, um, people will see the value in being developed. Um, I think that social is important. You know, you've heard over and over again, especially Steve just highlighted the social component, you know, there was a time where people were afraid of, you know, allowing people to post on message boards because of what they might say or what they might do. You know, those days are, have really have really gone, and now we can really leverage social, the social aspects of learning in a better way. I think that learning needs to be usable. Um, it needs to be, you know, easy to access. It needs to be less antiquated. It doesn't need to be boring. Um, I think that the more we can do this personalization, add context around it, you know, incorporate social components, and make it accessible, the more power we not only have as, you know, L&D professionals, but it's the power that we give these to really define their own learning engagement. Um, I think engagement really requires that fresh material um, with different perspectives in a variety that's accessible in a, in a variety of ways. Logging into the LMS shouldn't be the only way that someone can access training. And when they do log in, it shouldn't be the same thing over and over again. I can't tell you how, <laughs> many, how many times I regretted going into that, that office <laughs> space and trying to figure out where the cyber threats were. Right? Same course over and over again. Be same creative and, and make it fresh. So good points, Jonathan. And I guess I want to toss it back to Raydell to, uh, to facilitate any sort of questions we might have gotten during the presentation. Yes, great. Um, thank you, Steve and Jonathan. That was a great discussion. Um, and I think we ended on a really good point here because we actually have a question about LMS. So um, it might be for both of you here. How can an organization select an LMS that can successfully interface with human resource information system applications. So today's technology, and you know, I happen to be working for a company that has this technology. We we do have this. We do interface with HRISs. Uh, most of the times, uh, organizations have something at its core where it does personal action processing, and it has organizational structure, it has the reports, to who's to who, like who's my manager, that kind of stuff, that organizational structure, um, time and attendance and all that stuff is usually interacts with that and learning management is no different. Um, we also get into components where it's not just learning, where we're blending other modules like performance and succession and recruiting all into this, all based on an interface with the HRISs. So the technology is there. It is just establishing that connection where the, the information is exchanged with the talent management system, learning management system, whatever it is, with the HRIS. Okay, great. Um, and then along the lines of technology, while we're talking about it, this question that came in um, is good. So what do you find are the biggest obstacles to overcoming technology challenges in agencies? Jonathan, you want to take that one? Let's take a stab at it first, and then I'll take sure. it. Sure. Um, so 
some of the challenges to overcoming technology issues, I know you need to involve all the right people. Um, so if, whether it's, uh, you know, you're looking to implement, so let me give you an example. We were looking to implement Blackboard um, at the VA, our own instance of Blackboard, to support the HR workforce. We had to bring our IT folks to the table that we would um, basically that 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 would um, load this load the Blackboard instance and you know help us maintain the Blackboard instance. We had to bring our executive leadership um, so that they were aware of what was occurring. We brought in our um, public affairs people just to make sure that there was no issues with you know using message boards and. Um, that they understood how the tools would work. Um, just bringing the right people to the table so that you can basically identify what it is you want. And at that point, everyone can address their concerns. Um, so it really boils down to coming into a really effective business case, right, Jonathan? I mean, making people understand the need for the change and the need for the cost. Right, so that's building, a, that's building a business case. And I, I just want to do a, a shameless plug to GovExec today. Today I get a newsletter from GovExec every day, and I'm sure a lot of you do. If you don't, you should sign up. They're great. Um, the GovExec article today it was about my former agency, the IRS, the Internal Revenue Service, and how it's trying to accommodate this, this old technology that it has that it can't get money to update. Right, so. Now what's happening is it's becoming more and more expensive to maintain this old technology and it's not going away because we refuse to update uh, on the, the new technology, new hardware, whatever it is. So building that idea of making it a really powerful business case as to why we need this change and why we need to spend this money are going to become crucial in, in overcoming the obstacles. Security, all that kind of stuff, that can be worked out and it has been worked out with the various technologies that are out there. So I think those would be uh, a nice kind of uh, answer to the challenges that we face. Yeah, so um, really focusing on the why there. And um, I think we have time for one more question. So I'm going to ask um, one more question quick. Here that came in, how do you perceive organizations really changing the way they train their employees and really engaging in assisting um, the employees' learning experience? How do you perceive the organizations really changing the way they train their employees and really engaging and assisting their employees? I think that You know, organizations, so people, are the organization's greatest resource. We mentioned that earlier in the presentation. I think that keeping that in mind means that we need to equip our people to be able to, to do their jobs as best they can so that we can, so that we can meet our mission. I think that Engaging them means that we are communicating to them. It means that we are creating open forms for, you know, feedback so that as they communicate, we can address their needs. Um, we, a lot of times people will just create some training and never seek input or feedback, and it never meets the need. If there isn't a need, or if the needs aren't being met, um, it's not really going to be engaging. I don't know, Steve, what are your thoughts? Well, uh, the one thing I would point, and I know we're running out of time here, but one thing I would point out is, you know, realize you're not on an island. You're not alone in the battles that you're facing with your, your current workforce. We don't always have to go to funding or more money or we can leverage what government, other government agencies have done. It's this idea of networking within your community. There's a such thing as a CLO council that has all the CLOs 
participating in a con council, one of their biggest missions is to make sure that we're sharing resources across the government. There are other organizations that are focused in on training uh, for the individual training officers that allow for collaboration and sharing opportunities. So how do we make them do things differently? By exposing them to new ways to doing it. And it doesn't necessarily always involve a cost. It might have a networking component to it and a sharing component. All right, well, I think there was a lot of uh, great information that was shared um, and really, you know, the point on that we're all in this together and there is a great future that lies ahead of us here in the learning um, culture was uh, great to hear. So we are basically out of time, so I really wanted to say thank you, um, Steve and Jonathan, for your time and being with us today and, of course, to our audience um, for your time, attention, and questions. Um, I do want to remind you that there will be a link to the recorded webcast that's going to be sent out in your email um, either by the end of this week or early next. So please keep a watch out for that. And then thanks again for joining everyone today, and we will see you next time. Thank you. Thank you.